Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Sherban, the IT director for this term. As you already know, all of our, our, our event, uh, events are online, and uh, we will post all, all of the recordings on Facebook and on our YouTube channel if you want to rewatch them. Last week, we had Dr. Ingrid Kavangraven, lecturing in international development at the University of York, who talked about whether economics needs to be decolonized. And yesterday, we had Professor Randall Ray, a uh, professor of economics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, who talked about modern monetary theory and its influence on policy responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, uh, we are delighted to host Niels Rokovic, PhD student at Oxford and coordinator of the Complexity Economics Working Group of the Young Scholars Initiative at the Institute for New Economic Thinking. He will be talking about economic pluralism, its meaning and its importance. Uh, by the way, you can ask any questions on the pigeon holding provided in the comment section below. And thanks for joining us, Niels. Uh, we are happy to have you here and um, you can now take over and start the presentation. All right, thank you very much, Sherban, for the nice words. Welcome everyone. And uh, thanks for the, uh, to the Oxford Economic Society for inviting me. Um, as Sherban mentioned, today I'm gonna to talk about what pluralism is uh, whether we still need it. And um, in particular, I'm going to talk about pluralism uh, in relation to the recent empirical turn that economics has taken. So I will be talking about, oh, so why does that not work? Mm, oh, no, sorry about that. Um, so I will be talking first about uh, giving a brief primer on pluralism, what it means and what we're criticizing, um, then describing the empirical turn in economics, what has happened over the last decade or so in, in economics and um, changing more towards a data-driven uh, science. Then I will be asking whether this uh, empirical turn is good enough for uh, a proper pluralism as we've been asking, um, as we've been asking for with the student movement, um, like Rethinking Economics and appreciate appraising whether um, economics can be a purely data-driven science and uh, or what else is needed there. And last but not least, I will talk how we go from the data and the empirical results that economics generates to policy. So to start off, uh, what's the problem that we perceive in economics? And the problem is this dominance of neoclassical economics over the research agenda and the teaching in economics. What do we mean by that? Um, first of all, neoclassical economics has been thrown around a lot as, as a term and um, it's rarely defined what it means. And I'm going to talk about it here, meaning a school of thought in economics that's built around three fundamental assumptions. The assumption that um, there is an equilibrium to be reached in a market or in the economy or in any interaction of agents. Um, that agents in some way optimize um, something. So for example, firms optimize their profits or uh, consumers optimize their utility. And third, methodological individualism. So that means that the best way of uh, analyzing and studying the economy is to look at individual actors within this economy. So what's the problem with that? That first of all, seems like very legitimate assumptions and um, they very much are so neoclassical um, it has the student movement has been criticized for saying that neoclassical economics uh, is bad per se that's not at all what i'm arguing here but i'm arguing that it's just one school of thought around uh, among many uh, that can be used to describe the economy and that the actual problem is the, is the dominance and the exclusive use of uh, neoclassical economics how is that manifested um, that manifests in for example in teaching um, where if you've taken economics courses in under, undergraduate or graduate levels, you will have encountered theories that will only almost exclusively build on neoclassical um, methods and neoclassical models. And um, the teaching of neoclassical economics is also very skewed towards modules that teach methods and uh, towards exams that ask you to work with models instead of giving a critical examination of the model. Um, so, for example, here on the left, you can on the top, you can see a study that was done on uh, undergraduate macroeconomic and microeconomics modules in the UK and what kind of marks are given for what kind of questions. And we can see that um, 
operating a model and multiple choice questions give the overwhelming majority of marks in these exams, whereas describing or even evaluating models and testing them against or evaluating them against the real world give only a minority of marks. So that's teaching, but also in research, we can notice this dominance of, um, of neoclassical economics, which is manifested in several ways. So um, people who adhere to neoclassical economics as a main school of thought um, have an institutional dominance um, that manifests, for example, in the control over jobs and the hiring process, in control over major publications in the top journals of economics, control over funding, access to policymakers, and the Nobel Prize that gives us uh, that's almost exclusively given to neoclassical economists in one variety or another and uh, gives us a sort of status of, of uh, exclusivity. Um, and just as a brief example here on the left on the in the lower part, you can see a network um, of major economics departments in the United States and where they hire from. So an arrow here represents that the uh, node where the link is outgoing. Um, that's the degree, that's the institution where a PhD student gets their degree and it, the, node, the node where the degree is incoming is, this, is the institution that hires the um, PhD student. And as we can see, there's a very dense knit network amongst this very small number of institutions and uh, somewhat sort of an exclusivity of hiring uh, from each other almost. So then the question is, that's um, if, if that's the, um, situation that we that we agree with and that we that we analyze in the economics profession is there a way to do better than that and the answer by the student movement but also by many researchers has has been that yes we can do better than that and um, we need to be a more pluralist science so what does that mean to be pluralist um, it's mainly defined along three methods uh, th sorry three um, lines of thinking so the first line of pluralism is that we need a pluralism in methods the second is that we need a pluralism in theories or schools of thought. And third, that we need a pluralism of disciplines. What does that mean? So a plurality of methods means that um, you have for any given problem that you want to study a variety of tools that you can use and employ to study that problem. And I will argue that restricting the toolbox that you can use means also restricting the problems that you can legitimately study in economics, but there will be more of that later. Um, in, in historically, at least, economics has been very much based on a particular type of mathematical models um, that is derived from originally or historically from Newtonian mechanics. And whereas um, natural sciences such as physics, biology, biology and mathematics um, have made substantial progress and developed many further mathematical tools um, in the models that they use, for example, from the science of complex systems, from evolutionary modeling, from machine learning and data science, um, this, um, this revolution or this um, enlargement of the toolbox has been somewhat lacking in economics. So that's one thing, but um, the second thing that I think is missing from economics is a proper discussion on which methods are appropriate to, which, to study which problems. So, um, is these methods that we use from neoclassical economics, are these appropriate for studying all kinds of problems in the economy or are some problems better studied with other methods? Um, yeah. So that's the first line of pluralism. The second line of pluralism is a pluralism of theories and schools of thought. What do we mean by a school of thought? Um, it means that there's, they are not just internal variations in a paradigm, so not just different varieties of neoclassical economics, but actually a, another school of thought makes fundamentally different assumptions about the economy. Um, and it might also study different aspects of the economy. Um, so since these fundamental assumptions are different about what the economy is or how we can legitimately study it, that also means that um, these different schools of thoughts are not necessarily compatible with each other and cannot easily be combined into a unified body of knowledge. But I would argue, and so as the student movement argue, argued, that we might still learn a lot from uh, contrasting and comparing these different schools of thought with, with each other and allowing an open and intellectually rich debate in, uh, in these, between these schools of thought. Um, and a brief example here I wanna mention is physics, where actually in physics, um, 
even in physics, you have something like schools of thought, if you want, um, because quantum mechanics and the methods from, derived from general relativity theory are actually fundamentally at odds with each other. They, we, as the theory currently stands, they cannot be both true descriptions of the universe at the same time. So they're completely different ways of studying the, the universe. Um, but nevertheless, both of them have been extremely productive and fruitful research agendas over the last decades and um, have made huge progress in describing our universe and continue to coexist alongside each other. Last but not least is a plural, pluralism of disciplines that uh, economics should interact with. And just as a brief example or a data point here, I want to uh, focus your attention on the left panel here, which describes uh, for so the black line in the left panel describes that for any uh, for an average economics paper um, that you take, how many of or what fraction of its citations will go to other social science disciplines um, that were in contrast to um, to um, to other economics papers. And we can see here that economics is, first of all, in absolute terms, relatively low. So only about 5% of its citations go to other social sciences. But also compared to other social sciences, like political science and anthropology and sociology, economics is lagging far behind in how much it interacts with other social sciences. So that's our quote unquote solution for the dominance of neoclassical economics, uh, these three kinds of pluralism. Um, but so, so this is the, the standard story that's always told about pluralism. Um, and this has been you know, the dominant critique and the dominant solution for many years now. Um, but recently in the last couple of years, maybe in the last five years, uh, it has been very prominently argued that economics has actually fundamentally changed that neoclassical schools, the neoclassical school of thought is actually no longer dominant and economics has become an empirical uh, science to such an extent that um, criticizing neoclassical economics actually doesn't mean criticizing economics uh, in, a, in a substantial way. Um, this has been called the empirical turn in economics. Um, so what I wanna do now briefly is documenting this empirical turn, just very quickly. Um, what does this mean? So here uh, on the left side, we see that um, we see that for any publication year, the share of papers in economics that are empirical, theoretical, and econometrics papers. Blue representing the empirical papers. And we can see that from 1985 to 2015, the share of empirical papers in economics has increased really substantially. So by maybe around 25%, so a quarter more papers are uh, empirical now than they were back in the days. And that's really a substantial shift. Uh, that's quite, quite, uh, a, quite a size of an effect. Um, and on the right side, we can see that, that the same is true for citations, although to a lesser extent. So empirical papers are also steadily getting cited more uh, than, um, than before. This was the story within economics, but also in the interaction with other social sciences, we can see that uh, here, for example, on the left side, you can see the share of um, so for all citations coming from other social sciences towards economics, what kind of papers do these cite? And again, here we can see that the share of empirical papers that they cite has gone up substantially in the last 10, 20 years. Uh, and same for business disciplines. They rely much more on the empirical work of economists than on the theoretical work. And so this has led, led some commentators, most famously Noah Smith, um, to the conclusion that it wasn't other theory that eclipsed neoclassical theory, it was empirics. And so the argument, the implicit argument is that economics as in, in its nature has fundamentally changed. And the argue, the criticism that plural, the pluralist movement levels against economics might no longer be so relevant to criticizing the mainstream. So let's look at that. Let's appraise whether this is good enough for uh, pluralism and whether uh, or whether pluralism also has something to say about the empirical turn in economics. And I want to do this along three major lines. I want to uh, first look at what actually is data and where does it, co does it come from. Uh, secondly, I want to look at which methods are used to uh, analyze this data. And third, I want to look at the selection of research questions that uh, economics studies. So questions around data. Um, 
And there, to be fair, to, to give a fair starting point, it has to be said that the progress in the empirical turn in, in uh, the availability of data sets has really been substantial and, and uh, outstanding. So there's lots of different kinds of data being considered, for example, text data, data script from the web, um, and the, even the data sets that are available now are much larger than they were uh, a couple of years ago. So we have high, high frequency data, for example, from financial markets. We have government data sets that are detailed at a level that are unprecedented presented before. And it has been argued that this has actually been the main driver of the empirical turn is this availability of new large data set. That's first of all a good thing, no, no question about it. Um, but whether it's good enough, we have to look at several aspects. And I think um, the most important one to start with is um, which data is available. And um, there, if we start thinking about that, we, we notice very quickly that yes, there's more data than before, but it's still not necessarily, um, it's, or the data that, that are available are still coming from a specific place and are about a specific kind of, kind of people. And as an example, um, we can think about data sets being much more prevalent in the global north than, than they are in the global south. So if you wanna study, for example, um, small firms and how they behave, and you're looking for data, you're much more likely to end up with data sets uh, from the US because there's just good data available than you are, for example, from rural India. And um, this leads to a bias in the problems that you can even study um, being more represented towards the global, uh, the global north being overrepresented there than respect to the global south. But even within societies and within the same economy, we can see that um, what is measured, what is not measured is not necessarily seen. So um, for example, things that are relevant um, to understand the, understanding the economy, uh, like the informal economy, uh, the black market, or also unpaid work, household work, are um, normally not official market transactions. And so they leave no data imprints of, uh, in the official data sets. But that doesn't mean that they're not important. Of course, um, unpaid labor in particular, reproductive labor, care work, uh, raising children um, is extremely important to keeping the economy running. But because there was no good data available, this problem has been understudied um, in, the, uh, in the history of economics. It has changed a little bit in the last, uh, last decade or so. Um, but I think the fundamental problem remains that what is not measured is not seen. The second criticism about uh, data is to think about how representative the data that we have really is. And here I just wanna refer you to the conversations that have been going on around bias and algorithms. So a particularly pertinent example has, for, has been that, uh, for example, in visual uh, machine learning applications, um, facial recognition um, discriminates against people with darker skin color because um, people with darker skin color are un underrepresented in the training data. And so it doesn't necessarily recognize them to the same extent that it recognizes white people. Um, and while there has not been a high profile case of this bias yet in economics, I think it's very important to think about whether our data might suffer from similar biases and similar um, omissions in our data sets. East. This is slightly more anecdotal evidence. Um, I want to also, I want you to think about which data is accepted. And here, at least my personal experience and, and uh, from the seminars I've been in has been that, for example, researchers presenting results with data from the US are often seen to present sort of an abstract fact or like a, a fact about economics in general. Whereas if you work with data from the global south, for example, these results are often questioned whether they also hold in other con contexts and are treated with a sim with a with a distinct um, sort of criticism um, that's not leveled against data from the U.S. But again, as I said, this is more mostly anecdotal evidence. And so, to conclude the section, I just want to notice that I think data is not neutral. It doesn't just fall from heaven and is totally representative but it is shaped by the society and by the economy that it comes from with all the positives, but all the negatives as well. Second, um, after looking at data, I also want to think about the empirical methodology that's, that's used to analyze this data. And here again, 
to be fair to um, the empirical turn, um, there has been quite some progress made in what empirical methods are used. So while a couple of decades ago, um, calibrated models and somewhat obscure time series econometrics was really the main focus of empirical work in, um, in economic, economics, this has really changed towards a prevalence of experimental and quasi-experimental work, in particular randomized control trials, taking over as the dominant um, method in, for establishing empirical results. Um, even more recently, um, methods from machine learning and big data and data science have also been incorporated into economics, although that's still somewhat underrepresented. Um, so this is, this is good, again, but is it good enough? And I think the one glaring omission in economics work that, uh, is that you will find almost no qualitative work whatsoever in any uh, top economics journals. If you if you look at uh, you know the influential publications or the top economics journals, the hiring the the, the papers that people get hired on, um, it will almost never use qualitative methods like interviews, participatory observations, text analysis, narratives. This is just not really seen as an acceptable form of generating knowledge about the economy in in mainstream economics. Um, but I think that's not necessary. That's not a fair omission. Actually, um, these can these methods can really provide um, a complementary view on the same, even on the same data and the same phenomenon. Um, they can act together with uh, with quantitative empirical results to generate a whole like a more um, holistic picture of the evidence that's there. And um, so this mixed method research which is really prevalent in uh, other social sciences is very rare in uh, economics research. And just to leave with you with a slightly provocative thought there, and you really understand poverty without ever having talked to a poor person. Um, so sec the second um, thing I wanna talk about in empirical methodology is this dominance of uh, this supposedly causal methods, the experimental and quasi-experimental work um, that has also been described as the new gold standard, um, which is mainly randomized control trials, in particular um, made famous by the two people here on the left, uh, Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo, who received the Nobel Prize two years ago for their work in development economics using randomized control trials. Um, but most of what I'm gonna say also applies to natural experiments and applied microeconometrics. That's been another huge field in economic research recently. Um, so how do these methods work? Basically, you search for some external variation or you create some external variation um, um, that's supposed to be completely random and completely uncorrelated with your treatment. So you can, uh, the randomized control trials, always, almost uh, you, can, um, you can think about like medicine, um, like medical trials, uh, drug trials where you separate your uh, participants at random into two groups. You apply the treatment to one group and not to the other. And um, under some assumptions, you will, uh, you will then be able to measure the outcomes of that treatment uh, as the difference in effect between those two groups. Very roughly, of course, there's much more nuance to it. Um, but the hope is that by doing this, you have then established causal, a causal effect. So uh, that you really, you can say that this uh, effect that you've uh, isolated is a causal effect of the treatment on the control on the sorry of the treatment on the outcome variables. Um, but I just want to stress two things. Um, the the minor thing is that actually even this causality cannot be established without additional assumptions that you need to make. Um, so that especially in uh, in these natural experiments, you need to assume that there was no uh, no outside influence whatsoever from other factors uh, that could ha could have contaminated your data, which in some cases is valid. In some cases, it's it's, not, it's a strong assumption. So I'm not saying it's generally bad, but it's also not generally true. Um, but a very important point that I want to stress is that these um, that you need many strong assumptions if you want to transfer this causality into another context. So say you've studied the effect of school meals on school attendance in India, and you want to now apply this uh, in, in a school in Tanzania, um, you need to make some quite strong assumptions that, um, that you, 
to assume that the same causality and the same magnitude effect of the effect holds in uh, in this completely different context. Um, this debate has been called the debate on the external validity of these randomized control trials. And Ingrid, who has spoken here, Ingrid Bankgraven, uh, who has spoken here last week, is a big expert on that. But if you're interested in that, you can also look at the works of Nancy Cartwright and Angus Deaton, who have written a lot, a lot about that in the last years. And it's a still ongoing debate. Um, so there's one, this is one criticism leveled against them, but I want to focus in particular also on the criticism that um, these methods and the dominance of this method, these methods restricts the questions you can legitimately ask in economics. So if you're, if you're hell bent on using randomized control trials or natural experiments, you'll always search for situations where you can isolate one variable very clearly from all other influences. Um, and this, in my view, and this is open to debate, but in my view, this is actually a relatively small minority of, uh, of cases in economics where you can really legitimately do that. And sort of the big questions in economics, whether, you know, will this, will this COVID stimulus program, uh, program, will that cause inflation or not? Um, these important questions in analyzing the real economy cannot be studied with such, cannot legitimately be studied with such me methods. And, um, and thus we need to complement these research with more with other methods um, and uh, think about also the big questions that matter in economics. And again, a provocative thought to live with here is, uh, is whether development in the broad sense is the same as poverty allevi alleviation and whether um, by doing these randomized control trials, we need to narrow down our focus of research so much that we're sort of losing sight of the big picture. Last but not least, and I think in my view, very, very importantly, um, I wanna argue that the empirical turn also neglects important issues around the selection of research questions. Um, and in particular, first, I wanna focus on something called standpoint theory, which is something that has been introduced in feminist philosophy of science. And uh, the story roughly goes something like this. Um, so economics in particular is a social science and the social science is embedded in the society that it originates from. And because researchers are also embedded in the society um, or well, researchers are also embedded in society and the social position that you have in the society, be it your, your gender, your race or your um, economic status, for example, shapes the worldview that you have on, on the economy. In a second step, this worldview that you have that's shaped by your social position then influences which research questions you will ask and you will find an interesting object of study in, uh, in economics. And so the research questions you, you, you study cannot be entirely separated and will be uh, influenced by the social position you, can have, you have with respect to the economy. And I think a very nice example here is in the top left corner, um, exp explaining where um, researchers stand or are in relation to this elephant that they're studying. They're sort of asking different questions and getting different answers from this elephant. And only by bringing these different, uh, different um, observations and these different research questions together, can we get a full picture of the elephant? If we accept this, then I think this leads to quite fundamental questions about um, who should be in economics and who is represented there and whether we are inclusive enough as a discipline. Um, I think this very immediately raises the need for decolonizing economics, something that uh, Ingrid has talked about last week. And if you haven't watched her talk, I highly recommend you go look it up on YouTube. It's really excellent. Um, but you also need to democratize economics and bring more groups that are currently under underrepresented into the discipline. And just as a brief example, uh, this is a study that the American Economics Association did on, um, on all universities in the US that offer economics programs and saw, saw sort of um, which um, or from and, and looked at different underrepresented minorities and saw how many of the PhDs given out in economics actually go to these underrepresented minorities. Um, and 
for, if you look, focus on the third line here, the PhDs, you can see that the numbers are pretty dismal. So not even 10% of all economics PhDs go to underrepresented minorities. And the tendency is that the higher you go up in the hierarchy, so with professor, uh, with assistant professors, associate professors and professors, the numbers get even worse. Um, the same is true for women being underrepresented in, in economics and um, people from lower classes being underrepresented in economics, but also in the international aspect where um, who gets to shape research in economics is not, not um, independent of where you're born. So this is one aspect which is not neutral to, um, to the selection of research questions. Um, but also the theory that you have, that you have the, the theory that you think about uh, the economy with also shapes which research questions you can legitimate, legitimately ask. So if we think back about uh, uh, to the um, fundamental assumptions that I've mentioned in the beginning about uh, neoclassical economics, for example, it has this focus on the methodological individualism, studying the economy only through the lens of individual actors. And I would argue that if you have this view of the economy, then it immediately rules out certain questions you can ask, for example, with regards to power structures in the economy. Or if you have a view of that the economy is in equilibrium, it rules out that you can see certain phenomena uh, like financial bubbles in the economy. Um, if you ha have a view of uh, measuring quantitative things in the economy, then it will rule out questions you can ask about economic narratives and how they shape the, and influence the actions that economic actors take in the economy. And so the, the theory you have in your head about how the economy works and what it is shapes which research questions you can legitimately ask to it. Um, so it, it excludes certain things, but it also directs your attention towards other things. So um, theory not only um, restricts the set, but also guides you towards certain questions that it, it thinks are important. Um, so, for example, um, theories would, you know, if you've, if you've thought a lot about uh, a theory in a particular way, then it will also give you um, certain variables you need to look at as important drivers of, in the economy, and you will tend to study those more than looking than completely neutrally looking at uh, at which variables could be interesting to look at. Um, one example here is that um, the amount of research hours in the last decades that has been going gone going into identifying monetary policy shocks, um, I think it can be legitimately asked whether that's directly correlated with the importance of monetary policy shocks uh, in the economy. Uh, in, in, in understanding the economy or whether that was some sort of bias there where, where the theory says that um, monetary policy shocks are important and that's why this has been studied so much empirically. So this was the criticism of the intellect of the empirical turn um, in economics. Um, but now I want to focus a little bit uh, on what economics is actually for and what are we doing when we do economics. And I'm going to stick on my neck out here just a little bit and say that economics is not, not just a neutral science that should just gather facts about the economy, but it's important to also interact with economic policy making and in one way or another, try to make the, make the economy better, whatever that means. So how can we do that after the empirical turn? Um, first, I'm going to briefly talk about how data interact and the empirical results we have interacts with theory. Um, that I'm going to look at how data shapes understanding and last but not least, how from this understanding we then go to policy. So from data to theory. So if we're all doing just doing um, empirical economics now, does it mean that neoclassical economics is, is dead and criticism of neoclassical economics is still is, is no longer relevant? Um, I would obviously say no. I think um, the criticism is still very much relevant. And to argue for that, I'm going to use a theory, a famous theory in philosophy of science again, which is, was raised by Imre Lakatos, which goes roughly something like this. So a theory, a school of thought, is not only um, compromised by its, uh, its models and its methods that it uses, but also um, by a core of fundamental assumptions. As we've seen before, um, 
the um, I think these these fundamental assumptions are the methodological individualisms, the the equilibrium, and the optimization of the agents, and these core assumptions are different from the periphery of models that are then built on these assumptions. So um, like the avocado here, there's a hard core here that's actually not very much changeable and not testable. And only the sort of softer surroundings, the periphery of models and, uh, and specific methods is actually malleable. And since these assumptions are metaphysical, um, so you know you either believe in equilibrium or you don't, these are not directly testable. And while with any new data point, the periphery might change and the models might change, the core will not necessarily change. Um, and a particular good, particularly good example, I think, of this was what could be termed the last empirical turn, um, which was the rise of behavioral economics and experiments. So what happened there? Basically, a bunch of psychologists got interested in economics. Uh, put a whole lot of students in labs and made them do experiments and ask them things about economics. Um, and what they found out very robustly and very, what, like time and time again is that actually theoretical predictions from simple neoclassical models were not very good at predicting what um, the students actually did or the subject the participants actually did in these experiments. So they behave different in all sorts of ways. For example, they seem to have different discounting methods. They seem to have risk preferences that weren't well aligned with theoretical predictions and um, with their actions depended on framing and all sorts of things that, um, to summarize briefly, would, would seem that the neoclassical theory of this rational behavior um, yeah, did, not, didn't, did not do a good job at predicting these behavior. So, now you have this disagreement between empirical results and um, and the theory. So what happens now? Now you need to interpret these results and understand what it means for your theory. And what happened there is that there was sort of a split in the in the community and how to explain and model this. There was um, a group of researchers um, around Herbert Simon who argued that you know these results show that maybe people are not fully rational in the neoclassical sort of sense of the word, but maybe they are boundedly rational. They use heuristics um, to go about their lives. And you know, if they're doing poorly, then they'll adjust these heuristics, but they're not, for example, not necessarily optimizing what they're doing, but they're just satisfying. They're trying to be good enough to get by and then see what happens. Um, a second interpretation was that maybe people are actually rational, rational after all, and maybe they do optimize things, they do optimize utility functions, but these utility functions actually look substantially different than we thought before. Um, and there's now a huge literature that basically has tried to adjust utility functions in such a way that they're compatible with the empirical results that are generated. And what happened there is that this second way of understanding the problem, these adjusted utility functions, um, has gotten very much absorbed into the economics mainstream. And there's a huge literature and ongoing research all the time about um, new experimental results and new um, ways of understanding or new ways of modeling these utility functions with slightly weird shapes. Uh, whereas this, um, this view of modeling heuristics and bounded rationality has been very much pushed through the fringes in economics. It still exists, it's still there but it's not um, the mainstream view. And so that to me shows that um, when there is this substantial agreement, disagreement between the data, the empirical results and the theory, um, it's not that the theory as a whole is abandoned but the, and, and the core assumptions are also kept, but uh, they are adapted, the periphery adapts um, to accommodate these new facts, but the core assumptions don't actually change. Um, and I think it's not unreasonable to think that something like that will also happen in this empirical turn. It still remains to be seen. I'm not, I'm not diagnosing here. I'm just saying I think it's very plausible that while um, there are new empirical facts gathered, the fundamental core of the theory stays the same. Last but not least, we have now these empirical results that we uh, that we have gathered from our data that we've analyzed with our methods, um, are we done now? 
can we just do evidence-based policy? We have gathered evidence, we found something, can we just do policy now? And um, here I wanna draw on work by Jean Dres, for example, also very good, can highly recommend, who says that, first of all, if we wanna go from data to, to policy, what we need is to build understanding. And understanding re requires more than just evidence and more just, than just data work. It requires, for example, um, or it could require, for example, experience that you've been in the same or you've, you've been involved in, the, in this phenomenon. It could be discussion, discussions, it could be observation of the phenomenon, personal observation, but it could also be just abstract reasoning, theorizing, and it could be concept formation. So un this understanding requires more, it requires a combination of different pieces of evidence, not all of which are just data driven, um, to build a proper holistic picture of the phenomenon that you're trying to study. And again, this interpretation or this um, holistic picture is again shaped by the situated knowledge, by the standpoint theory. So um, who you are might also um, influence how you interpret the same result. And again, it's shaped by theory as well. So uh, what, what kind of theory you have in your head to, to think about the economy shapes how you interpret the same result. Um, and so it's not at all implausible that different people um, you know, with perfectly good intentions might interpret the same evidence quite differently. And there's not necessarily an access to a correct objective interpretation. So, but now we've, let's say we've, we've gathered uh, understanding, can we now do policy? Chandras would say, no, there's still more to do. Policy also requires values. So, if you, for example, want to um, find out where yeah, it, it's not just a matter of finding out what works um, in terms of, for example, I don't know, increasing school attendance. It's not just about what works. It's also, it works for what purpose and it works for whom. And these are inherently normative questions that are not, that you cannot do just, uh, that you cannot answer just purely based on evidence. Um, so you, you need to bring, out, bring in values um, to understand if you want to make the economy better, then you need to have an understanding of what better actually means. But even then, if we have understanding and if we have values, we're still not done because we still need to deliberate. So um, you cannot just do policy on your own, but you need to speak to, under, to the people affected, for example, the different stakeholders in the policy decisions and resolve differences you might have in understanding and in these values that you put forward. And this is an inherently political progress process. So um, this cannot be completely de depoliticized and it can also not be completely left only to economists. Um, if you're interested in that more, more I, can read, uh, I can recommend that you read, for example, the book, The Econocracy uh, on the Perils of Leaving Economics to the Experts by Joe Earle and co-authors, great book. So to wrap up and summarize, uh, what's next for pluralism and what have we learned? Um, if we look at our onion of uh, pluralism again, we've discussed pluralism of methods of theories and disciplines and that they each teach us different, um, different things about um, the, how we can analyze and understand the empirical turn in economics. Uh, a pluralism of methods is important because we need a variety of empirical methods um, to analyze the data properly. Also, for example, qualitative methods, um, and we need different tools for predicting and ex extrapolating from the data once we have generated results. A pluralism of theories and of schools of thought is important because it might give different interpretations to the, da to the data and build different um, aspects of understanding. And also because they bring in normative aspects and policy proposals um, that are not available if you have just one school of thought that's dominant. And the pluralism of disciplines is still relevant as an inspiration for different research questions and for understanding that economics is a social science and is fundamentally embedded in, this, in the economy that it's trying to study. But I also will argue that actually the pluralism we've defined before of methods, theories, and disciplines is also no longer enough. We also need a pluralism of people and a pluralism of places and economics needs to become an inherently more inclusive, diverse, and less hierarchical discipline, um, which is very important in its own right, 
but will also make economics research better um, because, as I've argued before, because of standpoint theory and perspectives, different people, different places might bring in different perspectives into economics research. It will lead to a bigger plurality of research questions that are important and a bigger data plurality as well. So last, uh, last slide. Um, if you found all of this interesting and you want to learn more about that, what can you, where can you go? What can you do? Um, how can you get involved? And here I just want to point you quickly to two kinds of to two organizations. The first is Rethinking Economics, which you might have heard of as well. It's a student-led organization, mostly based in the UK, actually, which is focused on changing the curriculum at universities and making the teaching more pluralist in uh, in economics undergraduates. And um, if you're interested in and you're based in Oxford, um, then you can always contact me. Um, email will be on the, on the next slide and um, reach out to me and I'll put you in touch with the organizers there. Um, there are similar networks in other countries. If you're watching not from Oxford, um, there are the German Netzwerk for Plurale Economic, the International Student Initiative for Pluralism and Economics and others. Um, so there's lots of different student organizations you can reach out to. Um, the other option to go for is uh, the Young Scholars Initiative which is more focused on research than on teaching and organizes conferences and workshops for young researchers and um, has different working groups and study groups organized around different topics. So if you have a particular topic in mind you want to look at from a pluralist perspective, I highly recommend reaching out to Young Scholars in, to the Young Scholars Initiative. Um, and in general, I just wanna encourage everyone to you know, ask lots of questions um, about curriculum change, about pluralism, read lots of things, discuss with all the people, organize and just learn more about the economy um, in whichever way or form you want. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Neil, for the presentation. That was really interesting. Um, we will now move on to the uh, Q&A part and we've got a few interesting questions from the audience um, and I'll try to group them into categories. So hopefully I'll manage to do it. So the, the first one um, is you mentioned the uh, training and testing data for models, and um, that's a, a usual problem with data science in particular and with models is the um, getting the data um, itself. And you mentioned that there are, for example, the high frequency data that's uh, highly relevant and can draw a lot of conclusions from them. Uh, but what other data is there? and um, would you recommend any interesting data sets uh, people might take a look at? Mm. I mean, not not per se, I think it I think what how you should approach this maybe is first to think about a topic and a research question you're really interested in and then to think about appropriate data. so i would I would encourage everyone to first think about what what problems you find interesting and what what you what questions you want to solve and then start looking for data i don't think there's a there's a general answer to to be named here to say this is this is the sort of data you should be looking at right now right and are there any specific techniques you could use in order to eliminate the bias in the data you find um, because i know for example in data science again uh, the uh, people in the field are really concerned with bias, and you mentioned bi bias as well, but is there anything related to economics in particular that you can do in order to remove the bias? Mm, I think it's very much an ongoing research area, uh, both in data science as a whole and also in economics, how to how to eliminate this bias. As far as I know, there's no, no consensus reached yet um, as to which methods are particularly um, are particularly appropriate to do that. Um, and I think there's only so much you can actually do with methods um, to make your data more representative. And um, other, other aspects of it also involve theorizing and thinking about it. So if you have data sets from the US, for example, think about whether this is applicable somewhere else or think about whether if you have data from New York, this is applicable to all of the US or something. So there's Again, I think, unfortunately, no, no general answer to be had here on how to eliminate bias. Yeah, and thanks for answering that. Uh, we actually got, got another question on um, this topic in particular. Um, somebody says, 
Um, thanks for the talk, it was excellent. And many successful methods in data science lack interpretability. And are these used in economics? And is there lack of interpre interpretability um, an issue? Um, I, I think so, very much so. Um, I think, well, so so maybe two part answer. There's um, the, the the methods um, that you mentioned from data science or machine learning or something are still somewhat niche in economics. So I think they're not not yet quite um, the mainstream of uh, of economics, and so it's maybe not yet a gigantic issue. Um, but I'm sure it will be uh, very soon in the future, and I think it's um, very important to to look at that in economics in particular because um, causality is maybe even more um, hard to identify or, or you know it's even harder to draw conclusions from such data in in economics compared to other disciplines so um, in economics you, it's even harder to say you know for example this is this is a, an empirical fact we've now identified that is um, immutable to uh, to changing conditions in the society or in the in the economy that we looked at. Um, yeah. Um, drawing on from this, um, you could somebody one might argue that data science has, has infiltrated economics on its own. So then, leading from that, um, in a sense, why is there a need for uh, the movement of pluralism at all? Uh, and could you argue that? Uh, the, the relevant fields would infiltrate economics on their own? Um, I mean, I think in some ways they have already. And I think in some ways, um, my, my talk has been trying to argue that no matter how good we do data science, um, it's, not, it's never going to be quite enough for pluralism, I think especially in economics, the results we get will require interpretation. The data we get, even in, you know, no matter how good that data science we, we, we do, the data we might get might not be representative. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm all in favor of new methods and learning more from data science. I'm personally doing my PhD on topics in data science, and I think there's a lot to be learned there. But my argument is that this is not good enough to really build a thorough understanding and build a, a proper pluralist economics discipline. Thank you. Um, we actually got one more question on machine learning and data science. Uh, Somebody is interested in uh, learning more about what parts of machine learning or which domains like computer vision, natural language processing will have the biggest impact on the study of economics from your point of view. Wow, that's that's a big question. Um, I I'm not sure. I mean, this is very very speculative, and I'm not deeply embedded enough in the research there to um, to to be able to answer that properly. Um, I think it's not going to be visual um, machine learning. I think it's probably not going to be audio machine learning either, speech and, and text recognition stuff. I think actually text might be, that might be relevant. So one area where there's a lot of progress being made right now is in um, text analysis using machine learning, topic modeling, um, and looking at all sorts of um, text data, you know, analyzing, for example, newspapers to see, um, you know, whether news has an impact on, on financial markets and stuff. So I think if I had to bet on something, it would probably be the use of text data, but there's lots and lots of other areas of machine learning that are becoming more relevant right now. Thank you. Um, so changing the focus a bit, somebody is asking whether uh, you think uh, PhD students would, would try to go into sociology instead of economics in, if they want to study old fashioned political economy. Um, since mainstream economics is too restrictive? Um, unfortunately, I think yes. I think this is, a, this is a phenomenon that's currently happening, and I think this is a phenomenon that will continue for a while. So 
I personally also, I've been trained in economics. I did my undergrad and master's in economics, but because the methods I use are also not yet really well accepted in economics, I switched to the mathematics department actually for my research. And I'm involved in the Institute for New Economic Thinking in, in Oxford, which um, yeah, allows for more scope for methods there. But I think very much so that um, more of these qualitative methods and more of these um, methods focusing on um, yeah, on, on power analysis, on um, on understanding society through qualitative methods, on text analysis and stuff. Those have gone into other disciplines, be it anthropology. I think economic anthropology is a really interesting field right now. Sociology, to some extent, political science. Um, yeah, I think there's there's definitely lots and lots of really interesting work being done on economics in other. Uh, in other de departments around the world. And if you want to learn more, that's, that's, that's also why I think uh, emphasizing this pluralism of disciplines is so important because there's a lot of really interesting work on economics that's, ju that's just not seen if you look at economics in a narrow sense and um, you should broaden your horizon to, to include other, um, other disciplines there as well. And, and as a personal advice, I do think that, or I have given this advice to other to, to students um, that I think if you are interested in these methods, you will have an easier time and a more productive time going into other disciplines and uh, uh, other departments to study uh, economics from that angle, unfortunately. And I hope that will change, but as an individual right now, I, if you're interested in that, I would recommend you look for, you know, don't rule economics out, but definitely look for backup options. And as a follow-up question to that, actually, how should people that want to switch departments and uh, go to, to other um, uh, fields, for example, how should they deal and confront the entrenched hierarchies that exist in that department? And in a sense, how should the economists that want to uh, transition into something else um, deal with the pressure from that field? Mm. I think this is an extremely hard process to, you know, if you've been trained in economics, but you want to switch to a different department, it's a, it's a hard process to learn the, the language and the, the habits and, you know, what's considered good scientific practice in other disciplines is definitely a hard thing to learn and will require work and, and effort. And uh, it's not going to be easy. Um, I think what, what I would recommend is to always look for people to work with who are interested in your in your research. So, um, you know, don't just switch to, for example, the sociology department, because you expect that sociology as a whole might be more open to your ideas, but maybe specifically look at different professors you might want to work with um, and talk to lots of different, you know, professors, but also other PhD students and uh, learn about they're doing, learn about whether they're interested in what you do. And if you have a group that's roughly interested in, in that's interested in roughly the same topics as you, you will have a much easier time transitioning and you will have a much easier time learning about you know the habits of this discipline than you would if you uh, if you just go go for it by yourself. And you know, shameless self-plug here. Um, this is this is the kinds of community that YSI is trying to build, right? So if you're if you're uh, at your own institution, you've had to switch departments and you can't really find this group, then look out for international students. You know, there are really always students who are in the same situation as you and who are at, equally looking for people to interact with and to, to discuss with and to learn from. And um, I can just encourage you, yeah, um, to, to have a look and, and see where you can find people who are like-minded like you. Thank you. And uh, one last question, I think. Should economists do anything in particular to attract non-economists in the field? Absolutely, I think so. I think really there is um, there's a lot to be learned from other disciplines, as as I've emphasized. And um, the best, you know, of course, there is a way of saying, you know, economics current economics professors should read more outside their discipline, um, and current economics researchers. And, and that would be good. But I also think that's a very long run or like not a very, um, not a, a strategy that will lead to results very quickly and to a changing mindset very quickly. And I think by exchanging actually people with different um, 
with different disciplines would be the best way, I actually, I think, to, um, to foster exchange of ideas between dis disciplines and to get other people into, uh, into economics. Um, and I mean, this, this is also happening. This, this, this has happened and will continue to happen that I, but it's, it's been very selective. And I think that's the problem. So for example, if you have an undergrad in maths or statistics or something, then you're very likely to actually to get hired into economics because there's always a, a, a need for better mathematical skills. Um, if you have a political science background, that's maybe much, le much less the case. Um, but yeah, I think ox and economics um, as a whole should absolutely be open to people with lots of different backgrounds who have something inter interesting to contribute to the study of the economy. Thank you. And that was actually the, the last question we had. So thank you for the talk and for answering the questions. Um, just for the audience, next week we will have Rachel Griffith, who will talk about the economy economics of obesity and you will find the event on our Facebook and the recording of this event on our YouTube channel. Um, thank you again, Niels, for taking the time to give this presentation and we hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for having me.